Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So welcome friends, welcome back to this uh, lecture on concepts and categorizations and basically I had given it the title let me organize. So basically that is what a concept and categorization really mean, it helps you to organize knowledge. Now what do we study in this particular lecture? So uh, what we do is this lecture is exactly an extension of uh, the semantic memory lecture where we saw how uh, world knowledge, uh, facts and uh, arithmetic rules and procedures and that kind of knowledge which, uh, which has uh, some element of consciousness into it, some element of uh, um, uh, a conscious retrieval into it, how are they arranged into uh, the uh, cognition, how, it, how is it arranged into the mental uh, concept or uh, the mental structure. So, uh, what concepts and categorization are? basically these are the process of organizing this knowledge. Now in the semantic memory uh, lecture, we saw that there are several models and these models what they do is they uh, go ahead and explain the organization of knowledge into semantic memory. And one of the famous mo uh, models uh, which was explained in the semantic memory lecture was the hierarchical structure model. So, but the hierarchical structure model explained is that the, there are nodes and these nodes are connected by pointers and so uh, the, uh, there are top level nodes and, and sub level nodes and so on and so forth. So, that is kind of arrangement which the uh, semantic memory uh, lecture talks about. So, basically what in this lecture we will see is this how what is the uh, meaning of this node or what is the feature of this node. And so, the nodes that we talk about in semantic memory lecture is basically concepts. So, concepts are kind of uh, mental representation, they are kind of nodes which hold a uh, lot of knowledge into it and uh, concepts also help us in categorizing information. So, why is categorization important? So, uh, as you remember that the human brain has a limited capacity and so it, it can do only limited number of jobs. Now, the number of neurons uh, is limited. We saw in the lecture on uh, long term memory that there is a limited number of information that you can hold on to uh, memory given the calculations which are given uh, there, which basically means that the human brain has to do something in terms of uh, organizing or in terms of uh, archiving data uh, in, uh, in the mental lexicon. And so, one way to do that is basically categorization. So, categorization is a process which uh, basically goes ahead and it uh, forms some kind of a mental bucket where we put in information based on either similarity or some other uh, aspect. So, basically that is what um, the categorization really mean and the principle in which categorization works is uh, basically the principle of how concepts are formed or what are the guidelines of a concept. So, using the guideline of a concept a categorization is done. So, let us then begin this lecture on uh, concept and categorization. Now, uh, let us look at this psychology, what is it? Psychology is uh, basically in most Indian universities, uh, they are taught under the arts stream, they are taught under the arts faculty or sometimes under the social science faculty. And uh, so, most people when you talk about psychology, they will say that it is a subject of the arts or a subject of the social sciences and a new uh, emergent social sciences, but most old universities will uh, club it into arts. But if you look into most western universities, psychology is not an arts, it is not taught under arts, it is taught under brain and behavioral sciences or sometimes it is taught under medical sciences or natural sciences. Now, this basic classification of where psychology should be is basically a demonstration to show how categorization happens and these categorizations of 
placing psychology into social science or arts or into the uh, natural sciences or uh, into the medical sciences basically they are done based on some kind of a conceptualization basic basically based on some kind of a rule or some kind of an uh, aspect or some kind of a feature that psychology share with these sciences and so this is basically formation of a concept. So, there is a concept and a concept is basically a mental representation, a mental bucket. So, the reason why these western universities go ahead and classify psychology in uh, to sciences uh, as opposed to what uh, in our country it is done in terms of uh, the uh, arts or in the social sciences is basically dependent, uh, dependent on the mental representation of how they look into psychology. And so, this is basically a demonstration of how concepts and categorization happen. So, they have some concepts, the westerners have some concepts of psychology because it uses uh, scientific methods of verification of uh, some kind of uh, data falsification, uh, some kind of reputations and experimentations and so they are classified into science. But in terms of our own country, they do not look at these aspects and they have some other aspects of psychology for example, is social aspect or organizational aspect and because of that they classify them into the, uh, the art sciences or in, into the uh, social sciences group dealing with society and so on and so forth. But that is the kind of uh, division which is there. And so, this example then explains what is the difference between a concept and categorization is. But before going into uh, the more details of it, let us look at what is basically the proper definition of a concept or uh, categories. So, starting uh, before starting, uh, I have some diagrams or I have some figures for you which, which are quite funny to look at and they explain. Uh, something about water concepts and water categorization. And so, first figure says that uh, there are a property. So, a concept has certain property and so, within the concept then uh, you have. So, here you see the concept of a cup and a, a coffee which is a sign of a concept. So, basically it is an emblem of a concept or it is the logo of a concept. And so, when you see something like this, you basically believe that it is a coffee shop or it is something which is hot beverage to be drunk. And so, it has certain properties. So, when it say it is a coffee, this drawing represents a coffee, it has certain properties and these are the properties of a uh, concept. And so, further on this is the concept. So, if, if, if you look into it, this is the emblem or this is uh, the referral or uh, the logo for a concept and these are the properties of this concept. And so, basically this is what a concept looks like. So, it is the mental representation of what a coffee would look, look like. These are the properties of a concept. So, every type of coffee that we classify here that we put here into this coffee uh, the diagram should have these properties and as you look into it this is called categorization. So, in categorization what you do is you take in items or you take in elements, events or instances of objects which are similar to the concept and place it under one particular bin and that is basically called categorization. So, as you look into it, so this is coffee and so there are properties of coffee is the shape, type, color, uh, aroma, ingredients and so on and so forth and in terms of categorization the reference are latte, cappuccino, uh, espresso or black coffee or um, uh, the iced coffee or it could be um, some other form of coffee which it could be the Irish coffee or some other form of coffee which it could be. So, basically this is the concept and this is the property of categorization and so categorization has done based on these properties. So, as you see that most of these type of coffees have these properties and so this is the process of categorization. Now, a funny cartoon to look into it and so here if you look on the right hand side there is this particular cartoon which explains that this lady says I do understand the concept of what cooking is, I do not know how does it apply to me, so this she does not want to cook and so that is the reason why she is putting into uh, these facts here. And so that might be the reason why she is saying what she is saying. So again uh, coming back to the definition of what uh, concepts are before we understand that let us look at what do humans do by doing cognition or what does cognitive, cognitive processes in actually they do. So, in general the cognitive psychologists believe that humans they form mental representations and uh, that these are processed by the cognitive processes. So, whenever we uh, 
uh, whenever we store knowledge or whenever we uh, take all knowledge and store into our uh, brain or mind, what we do is we form a mental representation of it. And this mental representation is what is processed by uh, the brain or by different cognitive processes. So, what is basically mental representation? Mental representation is the psychological equivalent of the physical representation, right. And so, remember uh, in the first lecture when we looked at different different kind of mental representations. So, we saw the spatial arrangement and the um, and uh, the abstract arrangement. So, in, in terms of uh, for example, if I uh, there are two mental representations that I will show you here. And so, in one mental representation what really happens is that I can show you a visual or a propositional mental representation. So, in the visual representation I draw this kind of a structure and I put a ball on it and so this explains the ball is on the table or in the propositional uh, representation I can say ball on and table are two propositions of how the ball is connected to it. So, remember from the first class both of them represent the same thing the idea is that the ball is on the table. And so, these two formats are what are called mental representations. And so, what are mental representations? These are the uh, psychological equivalent of physical representations. So, what cognition does is that they take in information from the world and form mental representations and use several cognitive processes to process this mental representation. And, uh, so, thus all knowledge in humans are stored as mental representations and that they in turn guide our behavior. So, basically then most knowledge that we have they are stored in terms of these mental representations different kind of mental representations be it is visual, be it in uh, auditory form, be it in, in propositional form and uh, different other different forms. So, propositional form is a famous form which Anderson uh, goes ahead and, and talks about. He says that most mental representations are stored in propositional form. So, there is a proposition to it and so that is how uh, basically it is it stored into. So, we did the some part of propositional uh, thought and propositional uh, representations in the uh, earlier classes. So, remember from there that is what it is. So, basically then the idea here is that it is mental representations that hold the knowledge and it is mental representations that are processed by human beings. And most behavior that human bo uh, do is by the processing of these mental representations. So, mental representations how are they stored? They are stored as concepts and categories. So, remember the coffee example what we did was the idea the, uh, the logo of a cup kind of a gion or a cup kind of a gion and a plate kind of a gion represents a coffee. And so, this is the mental representation a visual mental representation and when I show you this there are several knowledge which comes with it. For example, the properties, the type of things. So, the remembering different types of it is basically calls in the process of categorization and remembering that this is coffee is called the concepts. So, basically concepts and categorizations are basically play around mental representations. So, what is a concept then? What is the meaning of a concept? The concept is a mental representation of some object event or pattern that stores in it much of the knowledge typically thought relevant to object pattern or event. So, basically mental uh, the concept stores in some mental representation and knowledge related to that mental representation. So, in our earlier example the idea of the coffee logo it stores with it that this is the logo. So, the mental representation of a coffee in terms of the logo and some knowledge which is relevant to it in terms of uh, object event and pattern. So, for example, the different type of coffees which are available right, what is the aroma of a coffee, what is the taste of a coffee, where can I find it, what is the price of a coffee, uh, different uh, countries from where coffee comes in. And so, these are all related knowledges right related to the idea of coffee. And so, this is what is stored into that particular concept of a coffee. So, it is basically in terms of semantic memory if you activate that node, if you energize the coffee node several other nodes will energize. So, when I think about the coffee cup, when I see about the coffee cup a lot of knowledge comes to mind and these lots of knowledges are connected to different different semantic networks. And so, one is if one is energized the other is also energized. And so, depending on the context, depending on uh, the priority 
uh, the or nearness or semantic nearness uh, it it will decide which are energized more and which are energized less basically something from the semantic memory thing. So, basically let us now stick to only the idea of what a concept and categorization is. So, in terms of an example the idea of a dog the concept of a dog what does it comprise of it comprises of that it is an animal. So, first thing is in terms of a dog a dog is an animal it has four legs. So, basically another piece of knowledge which is stored with it that it has four legs it has a tail it has man, man's best friend these are all different kinds of knowledge and all different kind of facts which are there or it barks or it eats certain kind of foods or there are different varieties of dog all this information is basically stored into a concept. So, concept is basically a mental bin around which knowledge are stored a number of knowledge is stored or uh, comprised into or fitted into and so that is what a concept is. Now, if that is what a concept is what is categorization so, basically a category is defined as a class of similar things object or entities that share a couple of factors and has an essential core. So, basically what do I mean by this? It is type of things or classes of things which uh, which have similar objective uh, similar object or similar entities. For example, let us look at a uh, kennel of dogs or a field of uh, um, the dogs full of dogs. Now, when you look into it there are different kinds of dogs or if you have seen um, dog shows now in dog shows you see uh, basically a dog show is a category and so what happens is there are different kind of dogs or dog itself is a category. So, within the dog category you have different kinds of dogs you would have a Pomerian, you would have an Alsatian, you would have a Saint Bernard, you will have uh, uh, a German Shepherd uh, and uh, some other kind of dog different kinds of dogs which is a Rottweiler and so different kinds of dogs are there and all of them differ in some aspect or the other. So, there are variations there are differences within it, but they share one or two things which are essentially core. For example, uh, the idea that they have uh, bark now that is a core property. So, most dogs that you look into will bark although there will be an exception and so they, we discussed it in the last class in, in semantic memory where it might be possible that one or two incidents may not be similar. So, that is one thing to be looked at. So, categorization includes similar things together, but then what happens is they share one or two features or they share at least one essential core with it. So, uh, for example, the idea that why are all science courses considered as sciences. So, the basic question that we did or some similar similarity in perceptual biological or functional property. So, basically things which are clubbed together which are categorized together they share some kind of feature. So, either they share an essential core or they share some kind of uh, similarity between them. So, we can always have categories where things do not um, share properties. For example, uh, let us say the category of a house. Now, when I say the category of a house within the house you will have several things for example, you will have a mother a father which are human beings then you will have chairs desks or you will have um, tables and you will have eating things electrical appliances all of them together are there, but they, they can be clubbed together as a category. So, these features then share one feature which is they are parts of a category the house or the household right and so this is how it is. So, at times the most items in a category share some kind of a feature and at times what happens is that they do not share core features, but they share characteristic features or they share some properties which are either perceptual, biological, functional or some other relation, but something is shared upon them. So, items which share some kind of features together and club together is what is a category or what is the process of categorization. Then what is the nature of a concept? So, as I explained to you the nature of a concept has to do with the idea of categorization and what can a concept actually do. Now, concepts help us in establishing order on the knowledge base. So, what does it really mean? It really means that through categorization through form formation of concepts we can form some kind of an order. For example, what is the higher concept, what is the lower concept, who is bigger, who is smaller kind of a thing. So, within a number of concepts, within a number of items which we have, we can then assign some kind of order. Now, remember in the hierarchical semantic network, we looked at something called the subordinate and the supraordinate node right. And so, 
concepts uh, shared or concepts were always the superordinate node and other things items were the super uh, the subordinate nodes. Similarly, when we have concept these concepts allow us to basically uh, arrange things into order. For example, think about musical instrument. So, musical instrument is a higher level concept within that we will have string instruments, we will have uh, air, air instruments, we will have wind instruments, we will have uh, uh, other kind of uh, so, uh, instruments which can be beaten to be played for example, drums and all. So, different kind of instruments will be there. So, there is an order to it. So, and this order of how it starts with the musical instrument to coming back to a string instrument and within the string instrument you have the guitar or the sitar and then you will have several others. So, there is a hierarchy or there is an order and so this order classification is important and that is what categorization really or concepts really do. Also concepts help us to categorize that is what I was trying to tell you that with concepts we can put items into mental bucket. So, once we know that this is what a concept is, this is what concept A is this, concept B is this, these concepts will have certain features, right? certain aspects and these aspects will help us put similar things together right? and so that is what concepts really do. Also categorization helps us making prediction. For example, if uh, something is coming from uh, somewhere uh, a four legged animal is coming from somewhere wagging his tail and he comes near us and his uh, uh, tongue is, uh, is out of his mouth and he is uh, sweating kind of dripping uh, onto food so, and he is looks more or less like a category of a dog. Then you can predict that it will also bark. Right? And so, this idea that if it looks like a dog and can classified into a dog, you can make predictions. So, categorization helps you in making predictions of what a particular item, a new item into a category is supposed to do because it should share some features of the category. So, with that, with all these features, you can then say that if this is a dog, it is going to bark and it is uh, going to be men's best friend and so on and so forth. So, this kind of uh, conceptualizations can be developed right? and so that is what a a concept really does. So, what is the nature of a concept? So, for ex explaining the nature of a concept, several models were developed. There were different models and these models actually go ahead and develop the uh, nature of a concept. For example, one of the model or uh, the oldest possible model is called the classical view model. Now, what is the classical view model says? It is actually a model which dates back to the time of Aristotle and uh, so it is uh, dominant, it was dominant in psychology till the 1970s and then later on newer models for example, the explanation based view of um, uh, categorization and conceptualization came in and so that took us uh, or that took uh, the center stage. So, the classical view is the most uh, um, reliable view up till now. So, what does this view say? It says that all examples or instances of a concept share fundamental characteristic features. So, basically what it says is that no matter what happens, all instances or all different type of items which are clubbed together in, in a concept which are called, uh, which are uh, known to be part of a category and which resemble a concept, they share certain fundamental characteristic features. Right? For example, if I say that a dog, then all dogs should have a tail, they should weigh, they should bark and so on and so forth. Now, in particular, the classical view of concept holds the uh, holds that the features that the concepts share together or items which uh, represent the concepts share together represent uh, the features are represented are individually necessary and collectively sufficient so mostly the what the classical view says is that most items which are grouped or categorized in, under a concept or categorized or known to be part of a concept or known to form a concept or resemblance to a concept. Now, they should have something called features which are individually necessary and sufficient and uh, collectively sufficient. Now, what is the meaning of individually necessary and collectively sufficient? Now, individually necessary means that each example must have the feature if it is to be regarded as a member of the category. So, basically each and every example should have the feature, the, the kind of feature for it to be called a member of of that particular category or a member of that particular concept. For example, looking again back into the dog concept, so each member should have 
one feature that is barking. So, each dog should bark or it should have a tail uh, which should wag, right. It should not have a drooping tail kind of a thing or it should have a certain kind of face, drooping uh, ears, man's best friend or whatever you want to. So, it, it should have uh, that thing. So, uh, uh, so, individually necessary means that every item should have that particular feature into it. And what does collectively sufficient really mean? So, collectively sufficient means that anything with each feature in the set automatically becomes an instant of the concept. So, if something is presented to you a new item is presented to you which has each feature of the concept or each property of the concept it automatically becomes a part of the concept it becomes a category or the concept. So, in terms of looking at the triangle uh, if we look at the individually necessary thing individually necessary thing says that there uh, each triangle should have three sides. If it has less than three sides it cannot be a triangle, if it has more than three sides it cannot be a triangle. And what does necessary sufficient mean? Necessary sufficient conceptualizes to the fact that it, it should have three sides, it should be a closed geometrical form and then it is a triangle. So, any figure which has three sides and which have some kind of a closed geometrical form necessarily is necessarily called a triangle, whether you call it a equilateral triangle or you call it a, um, a, a right angle triangle or ipsilateral and so all kind of triangles would be there. But the idea is that it should have these three sides and a closed geometric form and that is what the uh, classical view says. So, it very simply it says that uh, there is uh, most concepts they share instances and fundamental characteristics and these characteristics are individually necessary and collectively sufficient example look at this, uh, let us look at the concept of a bachelor. So, the features are it should be male, adult, unmarried and human. So, then there is a problem to this right. Now, if I look at somebody who is 10 years old, now a 10 year old person is a male or a boy who is 10 year old, he is a male, he is an adult, he is unmarried and he is human, but he cannot be a bachelor and so these are the deviations which are there. And so, individually necessary collectively sufficient that is the problem with it. But then uh, that is a thing for the, uh, uh, the criticism of the model, but before that let us look into this. So, then bachelor should have these four aspects. Now, any person, any male who is an adult and who is unmarried and who is human is actually a bachelor. Similarly, even numbers, what are the, uh, cons the concept of an even number, what are the features of those uh, numbers which are even, the features are it should be first an integer, so can be explained in the form of p by q first and it should be divisible by 2. So, if we can do that then it is an even number and triangle for example, it should be a planar figure, so it should be a figure which should be in a two dimensional or it should be in on some plane and then a closed geometric figure. So, figure remember from uh, the first class where we are doing perceptual illusion and we, we showed you this kind of a triangle right and so this cannot be called a triangle the reason being that this feeling that I am doing here is done by the brain and so cannot be a triangle until and unless it has all the sides like this it cannot be a triangle and so it is not a triangle and so for a triangle to be a triangle it should be a closed geometric figure and then it should have three sides, two sides cannot be a triangle and so that is what the features are. So, then what are the implications of this classical view? The implications are concepts are mentally represented list of features. So, what then uh, this classical view says is that concepts what they do is that they mentally represent a list of features which should be there. And so, any item which comes in new should be compared against this list. So, if I say if a dog or a triangle, a dog for example, if a concept then I have a list of features. For example, it has to have four legs, it has to have a tail, a wagging tail, man's best friend, uh, should have, uh, should bark, uh, should have tongue out most of the time and so on and so forth. So, these are the number of features or list of features and so classical view says that concepts mentally represent a list of features and so any new instance is compared across that and the more fit it is, the more closer it is. Also, it assumes that membership in a category is clear cut. What this particular uh, concept or this particular model says is that any member of any category has a clear cut boundary. The, uh, the idea is that you are either a part of a category or you are not part of that category and so that is how categorization is done. This boundary is very clear cut. So, you are either a dog or not a dog right and so if you do not have the, the sufficiently necessary features or individually necessary features, then you do not become a dog. So, you should have feature A, let us say I have A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H features which are rated for a particular concept of a dog, then any new instance or any new uh, 
uh, element which basically is compared to this instance then has to have these features. And so, this it says that the boundary are very clear cut there is no disguise in the boundaries or there is no overlap in the boundaries. And the third is that it implies that all members within a category are created equal uh, which basically means that there is nothing called uh, um, uh, ideal concept and a non ideal concept. What they say is each member of the category share equal kind of uh, uh, or equal in all uh, relations. So, most members within a category are equal in some footing that is what the proposal is all about. Now, these are the problem and so uh, looking at dogs most dogs are equal that is what they will say about. So, although um, uh, talking in terms of size, so not talking in terms of size, most dogs behave in similar manner that is what they will talk about. And when I say it is clear cut which basically means that uh, uh, Chihuahua or uh, Siamese cat are different because there is a clear cut idea that they do not bark and so by barking is a individually necessary feature. So, since, since uh, the Siamese cat would not bark it is not a dog and since a shuava box it is a dog and so that kind of a clear cut boundarization or that kind of a clear cut boundary is out there. So, these are the three implications of this view, but then this view has several criticisms. So, as I said it is an old concept and so it has several problems with it. First, Rosha found that people judge different members of a category differently right and so what does it really mean? It means that different different uh, members are uh, categorize or arrange differently. That is the reason and the reason why is that people judge category membership in terms of how good a fit they are to the category right. And so, when I look at an organization that is the classiest dog or the doggiest dog that I can talk about, but when I look at a chihuahua that does not seem like a dog. And so, this variation of goodness of which is which element is a good fit to a category all characteristics of a category and some members not having this good fit is a problem because uh, the implication says that it is very clear cut each member share, share more or less the same features, but this goodness of it and the uh, so uh, for some people uh, a latte would be or a cappuccino would be a coffee, but a black coffee would not be a coffee and for some other people black coffee is the ideal coffee and other coffees are variations of it. So, not a coffee and remember those or think about those people who are hardcore junkies in terms of coffees. So, they will call coffee as a coffee, black tea as a tea, but all other forms of tea as variations of tea and not a tea right. So, it is variation of tea and so this differences say that then the different kind of coffees or different kind of teas which are available are not in terms of sharing same features or not equally footed together which is the implication of the classical view. The idea, idea is that people store and refer to a list of necessary features when judging a category membership is doubtful. Now, what does this basically say that mentally remembering a number of features and then comparing is something which people generally do not do and that is the reason why you have abstract categories. You uh, tend to have categories which are abstract which does not fall into uh, some kind of a classification system and that is why when I look at uh, categories like household or categories like marketplace. Now, these categories then not then do not go ahead and compare uh, this kind of a uh, relationship or this kind of a mental features and that is why uh, the problem is and that is what the problem is all about. So, people do not refer to these kind of lists and they make violations in terms of comparing things to a list right. And the third thing is that most people cannot generate list of features that are individually necessary and collectively sufficient to specify memberships into a category. So, basically what it says is that when it comes to telling people and so there are experiments done in which people were asked to generate list which says that what should be the list or what should be the uh, uh, types of features which anybody uh, or any new element in that category should have and which should which should be the most necessary features which are there people could not come up with that and that was the problem with it right. So, people were not able to generate this individually necessary and collectively sufficient uh, feature they could not pinpoint what is individually necessary and what is collectively sufficient and so that is one of the problems of this particular view or this particular idea of the uh, categorization model the classical view. And so, to explain further or to circumvent 
the problems of the classical view, another model was proposed and that is called the prototype view or prototype model of uh, categorization. And so, what is this model? It says that like perceptual researchers, conceptual researchers also believe the idea of mental prototype. Now, remember from lecture on uh, the perception where we thought uh, deal, dealt with the prototype view or the idea of prototypes, right? And this was the bottom one of the bottom up theories. And so, we are looking at how prototypes are formed. And so, in terms of categorization also, conceptual researchers also think about mental prototypes. Now, what are these prototypes generally? These prototypes in terms of uh, visual researchers, the prototype was an abstraction, right? It had all the uh, all the properties of the particular uh, all the visual properties of the uh, elements which are clubbed together. Similarly, in the conceptual researchers, mental prototypes are idealized representation of some class of objects and events. So, these are idealized representation. Now, one problem with the classical view was they were never talking about these idealized representation, but this is circumvented with the prototype view where they say that prototypes are idealized representation. So, idealized representations then uh, may not have all the features necessary or may not have features which are individually necessary and collectively sufficient, but it can also be possible that prototypes may not represent or may not be a part of the cat, uh, category itself. It could be something else, thinking of something else, right. So, what would happen is prototypes are basically idealized representations uh, of some class of objects and events. So, these are standards or these are kind of uh, the class or the idealized class. Now, prototype of concepts are feature or aspects that are characteristics that are typical of member of the category uh, rather than necessary and sufficient. So, basically what uh, this theory banks on is the typicality factor. What it says is that the prototype view says that uh, prototypes generally are features uh, uh, or aspects uh, which characteristically or which define a particular uh, category, right. And so, if so, for, so if you want to make a prototype, we have to look at several uh, 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 instances of that particular category, and from the several instances of category, then we'll be able, able to uh, basically bring out those things which are common. So, prototype view is, or the forming of prototype is similar to forming commonness among uh, among a lot of data, and so there are lots of statistical technique which does that, right? And so here also the prototype we are forming a prototype we find the commonness those properties which are shared by most members of the category right and so if most members of the category share a feature that is should be the feature of a category and so it should it, it could be one feature it could be multiple feature which most members share now, it does not specify this thing that it is individually necessary and collectively sufficient, but it says is what it says is that if I am looking at a category and if I am looking at a number of elements in a category and if there are commonalities between them, if there are common features between them, the commonalities are what sum together to form the prototype. Now, what do I mean by this? So, the meaning of this is that no individual feature or aspects need be present in the instant for to be counted as a member of the category. So, we are not looking at any individual feature, right. We are not looking at one particular feature which should be shared by all people. We are saying that most members have these features. So, not that one feature should not be present in everyone. It should be that it could be that most people uh, uh, have a particular feature, but some of them may not have it. And so, that could also be a reason for a particular uh, category for example, or uh, prototype. For example, let us look at cars. Now, most cars would have an engine and would have four seats, right? And that is how definition of car is. But how, how what about the definition of a flying car? Now, when I talk about flying car, it does not uh, go or it does not run on the road. And so, the sufficient feature that most cars run on a road is exactly not true. Similarly, for the fact that toy cars may not have an engine, but then still they are cars, right? And so, we can be classified under cars. And so, this is this, these are the variations. So, one of the things is that no individual feature need be present is one of the features that uh, the prototype view says to be counted as a member of the category. But the number of more number of characteristic feature or aspects or instance has, the more likely they be regarded as a member of the category. So, basically, here if we do not talk about one individual feature, one defining feature but we look at more number of characteristic features. So, it is kind of more the merrier, right. So, the more number of features you have which resemble you or which make you closer to a category, the more typical you are to that category and the more 
idealize your prototyping. Right? And so, one way of doing it is to look at a number of instances. So, when we are faring, uh, looking at prototyping or when we are looking at how to make a prototype, the first thing that, that needs to be done is to look at a number of variations of that category, a number of variations of that concept and with that variations find out the commonality, right? which has the highest commonality. Once you have that commonality, that commonality should be what should be idealized as the prototype or that commonality should be a, a feature of the prototype because most members have it right? and that, that is how they are defined. Now also, the prototype move of category and concepts refer to the family resemblance structure of concept or they basically go ahead and say that this is come kind of a family resemblance structure. So, what is the family resemblance structure? A structure in which each member has a number of features sharing different features with different members. Right? So, that is the idea. So, a structure where each member has a number of features sharing different features with different members. So, what would happen is that there would be some commonality, but then each one shares uh, other features with someone. And so, a good example to understand this is look at the central figure 9. So, if you look at the central figure 9, the person here, he has these mustaches and so this, this is the idealized version and it is the idealized version because it has properties from all of these. right? So, if you look into all uh, the several variations of 8 different forms of image. This is called the family uh, view of prototyping and so here what happens is if you look into this, this person does not have a moustache and so has a beard and has these eyeglasses. This person has a beard but has, and has eyeglasses, but the color of the hair is different, does not have eyeglass, beard and moustache both. Here it has only beard, different color hair, no spectacles with spectacles and so on and so forth. And so, this is the most idealized version. The ninth version is the most idealized version because it shares a number of features with all of them. Right? So, it is all about commonalities. The more number of features that any element share uh, with a particular category, the better example it is of that and the better chance it stands to become a prototype. So, prototype is that particular element which has shares most number of features or which shares commonalities between different different uh, items in that particular category. So, a prototype is basically a some form of abstraction that includes all the characteristics of a category and may or may not be actual instance of the category. So, it is at times what would happen is a prototype is developed, but the prototype is not the actual product, right. The prototype is not the actual manifestation. So, I, I may have a prototype of something, I may have an idealized concept of a something, but it never actually uh, becomes a category item of the category. So, prototypes are that kind of a thing right because uh, forming a prototype of that type is not possible right and so the idealized phone for example, the idea of idealized phone is that it should do so many things, but most phones should share this for example, one of the things that the phone should do is uh, should also be able to try teleport you, but that is the prototype right, but phones do not teleport you in real senses. So, most phones do share other features of a teleporting machine, which is your idealized construction of what a prototype is, but then the prototype cannot have an existence in itself. So, at times what happens is the prototype cannot be demonstrated, but then the prototype is an idealized version of a uh, I should have uh, it is an idealized version of a category. Also prototypes are often thought of as mental summaries or averages of an instances. So, what that is what I was trying to explain to you. What really happens is I look at all the instances and I look at the commonalities and based on that I create an average and the average of all the number of elements which is there that is what the prototype is. It is the average, it is the uh, exact average and so average has all parts of it. Average is related the average point or the mean is related to every element onto um, on onto my uh, data and so basically that is what my prototype is, it is a mental average. Also concepts they exist at many levels of hierarchy, what really happens is the concepts they uh, uh, there are different hierarchies. For example, the top level concept, the bottom level concept. Remember the example that I gave you in terms of musical instruments. So, musical instrument is a higher level concept and a uh, bass guitar is a lower level concept because it forms or it is uh, coming under the concept of musical instrument. right? And within the higher dimension of musical instrument is the instrument. Right? And so, these are the different categorizations. So, basically concepts exist at different level of hierarchies, but one level of abstraction appears 
psychologically fundamental. Now, in terms of uh, prototypes at the psychological level or at the fundamental level or at the basic level most prototypes should have the same feature and that is what it, it talks about. So, this is the basic level and different from both higher level sub subordinate and uh, the uh, lower level uh, that is the subordinate concept. So, the basic level is that level at which prototypes are formed and the basic level is that level which most items that belong to the category share. So, uh, basically then uh, this is that level where that feature is there or that feature is shared between all items which are the core feature which is the core feature and remember the dog example. So, barking is one feature which most dogs should have. So, no matter what kind of dog I am looking at whether I am looking at the chihuahua which is a very very small dog and a pamirian which is again a very small dog to the great dane which is a huge dog uh, out there or uh, St. Bernard which is again a huge dog and big dog or Rottweiler which is again a kind of a temperamental dog and uh, other kind of dogs to be look at Alsatian which is a huge dog. So, all of them then share. So, there are different levels of uh, uh, those prototypes. So, the highest dog, the slowest dog, but then the one feature, the, uh, the basic feature is barking and at that they should be able to uh, coincide or that that is the way. So, concepts then have some kind of a basic level uh, where both uh, uh, there, there is a difference or at that level they should match. Now, what is the, criti uh, the critique of this prototype view? Now, one of the critique of this prototype view is that the limit of the conceptual boundaries. Now, where is the limit of this conceptual boundaries? What should be the limit when something should be uh, not referred as a part of the concept or not example example of a concept or an item of a concept and those that is not defined or basically this prototype view then as prototype view says that it is a mental average and so any element can enter into it and so there are no limits uh, there are the, the, the conceptual boundaries or there are no clear cut boundaries which have been defined by the prototype view because any new item can also share some features and so where is it that this averaging really works or what percentage of match should the new item have that is not defined. And so, there is no limit to this conceptual boundaries of where uh, the limit is to be drawn. Another thing is the typicality rating which basically says that uh, what is the extent of typicality. For example, this typicality. So, when I say the, the uh, let us say about talk about birds. Now, if you go to the west robin would be a typical bird right. But then where for India since people have not seen robin, how does robin become a bird or basically people will not think about robin when you say a bird. People will think about a crow or a sparrow or some other kind of a bird that you or a sunbird for example, when you think about it. So, basically then this typicality the idea of typicality rating is another feature which, which should be looked at. And so, what happens here is that as context changes this typicality changes and so that is not explained by the prototype view because when I say this is the prototype then it should be universal kind of a thing and so most items should be there. So, that is not explained as concepts with the with the changing of context changes the prototype changes and so it could not be explained. And the third interesting view is called the exemplar view and so what does the exemplar view say? It says that concepts include representations of at least some actual instances. So, it denies the idea that there are mental summaries or there are sufficiently individual features which are there and this view goes ahead and says that there is some actual insta instance or there is some actual uh, representation to which things are compared to which new items are compared and that is how they form into categories and that is how a concept is developed right. So, what this theory says is that there is an example always in mind. So, when I think about something, when I think about a car, I am thinking of a particular model of a car and that is the example view. So, categorizes new instance by comparing to representations of previously sold instance for example, examplers. For example, when I when you show me a new car what I will do is my head or my brain has an idea. So, here the prototype is actually in terms of something which is existing. Now, the difference is in the prototype view my prototype could be an instance which does not exist, which cannot exist, but in the exemplar view it has to exist. So, when you show me a new car, a new kind of car, what I do is I compare to the idea of a car which I have in the my mind and this idea is actually a uh, actual instance of it. So, I think of the Maruti Bellino which I have 
and I compare it this with any other car and then say whether this item is a car or a truck or a scooter or whatever it is. So, that kind of a thing is there. So, my mental concept is there or that mental exemplar is there and I'll do the comparison. And the third thing is difficult categorization unclear atypical instances because such instances are similar to examples of different categories. And so, when we have atypical instance how does the exemplar really work? So, suppose let us say if I have a bird with clipped wings, how do I categorize them? And so, it is a problem. So, difficult categorizing unclear uh, atypical instances. According to this view, it is very difficult of how do we uh, uh, categorize atypical incidents into it. So, what are the critics of it? The critics is it is the prototype view, like the prototype view, it is too unconstrained, it is hugely unconstrained. Uh, in the sense that there are no boundaries and fails to specify which instance which eventually be stored as exemplars. So, how do I develop the exemplar? That is the problem. And with the pro like the prototype view, I do not have boundaries into it and what makes an exemplar? For example, the car I possess should be an exemplar or should the exemplar be the car I desire to possess or should it be something else? So, that is not very clear and that is a problem with this particular view. Also, how different exemplars are called to mind at the time of categorization is also a problem. And so, another thing is that I might have seen so many cars. So, basically the kind of car that I am doing the comparison to for example, the car I possess, how does it come to mind? How does it compete with all the cars that I have known as a comparison standard? So, how do I bring forth that standard? That is another question which is out there and which this particular view does not explain. And so, this is these are the two critiques into this. So, in today's lecture what we did was we looked at what is categorization and conceptualization, how does this categorization and conceptualization really work and we also looked at uh, the different models of it, the classical view, what are the problems with the classical view and what are the benefits of the classical view. We also looked at the uh, different uh, prototype view which uh, talks about the mental averages and summaries of making a prototype and how it it scores over the, the, the classical view and then we talked about the exemplar view which is basically an instance of the prototype and how that explains or that goes ahead and uh, makes it a task easy in terms of categorization and conceptualizations of making concepts and uh, categories. Thank you.